And I was having my hair done by people who sometimes were white people mm. who said they did black hair, but yeah. don't make that mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Get that white person away from your head. Welcome to Impolite Company, where we talk about all the topics that interest us and that impact our lives as queer black people in the workplace. I'm Ella, and I work with companies on transforming their leadership cultures. And I'm Kieran, and I'm a leader in design and research in the tech space. How have you been since the last episode? Like, um, the first, our first foray, which we said was a bit like a pancake. Um, I love that we've, over the last couple of weeks, when we've kind of been listening back, mm. um, I think we've learned a lot about ourselves and also... Um, what could make this podcast really interesting and the things that we want to maybe change and lots of different questions about um, how it could work. So I hope listeners enjoy being on that journey as well. Yeah, I think I've... We were, we were joking before this about how we have the... You know, it comes back to the perfectionism thing a little bit that we talked about in the in the first podcast, but how... We kind of are, are grappling with this. How much do we need to know before we launch something? Yeah. And how much do we make this kind of casual and free-flowing and, and pretty raw um, and, you know, like the conversations we have when they're not recorded? Uh, and so I think that this has been a, yeah, a really good learning experience. I think since the last episode, we've already got much more of a sense of the themes that we want to talk about and the types of things that we would want to listen to. Um, so I think, yeah, it's there's no substitute for doing things, which is a piece of feedback I've always got to keep giving myself. <laughs> yeah. We were saying that actually... So Ella was saying to me that she'd been speaking to a friend when we were on our way here. Um, and there's that like paralysis that sometimes happens when you overthink things and that we're we're probably a good, a good balance for each other because... Um, I'll just book stuff, right? I'm just like, book it. And that's my way of like putting guardrails up and making myself do things because I think I can have a tendency to do a similar thing where I'm like, the more and more I think about things, yes, I may be prepared, but then there is a, there is like a real thing that is being overprepared. And then when I'm trying to deliver something, I'm overwhelmed because there's just too much stuff to go through. Too much content. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we're finding the balance, I think. Yeah. We may or may not cut this out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> um, anyway, I um, there's a there's been lots of questions, I guess, with the um, the lady hussy debacle, um, and we had a few conversations when we were thinking about what we wanted to talk about today around um kind of how this relates to bringing your authentic self to different environments um what that actually means um and you know what it opens the door to um it's not always positive as it's branded it can actually be quite um the opposite um it i think it's oversimplified but I'd be really interested to get your thoughts on that, Ella, of what bringing yourself to work means to you and maybe some experiences you've had with that. Yes. Well, so I think that this phrase, the one that's almost trotted out so much, especially in DEI work, it's almost become a kind of trope is, um, you know, we want our people to bring their authentic selves to work. We want them to be able to bring their whole self. And um, I'm talking about this in a slightly mocking tone, but but the the principle behind it, or how I interpret the principle behind it, I think is is a noble one. It's this concept that different types of people who have different life experiences and different backgrounds shouldn't have to conceal or hide or circumnavigate parts of themselves when they show up at work. What we're essentially talking about is we, sh we shouldn't have an environment in which people need to code switch. Yeah. And I think that's a good aim for any organisation to, to genuinely work towards. So, so that kind of sentiment, I think, is, is a good one. What I think adds complication to this debate and, and nuance to this debate is 
how much is that genuinely possible yeah for people who are black for people who have ethnic minority backgrounds for people who are lgbtq plus um for people who have different religious um practices you know how practical is that what are we asking of people in terms of exposing themselves have we actually set up an environment that enables that in a really psychologically safe way so are we putting the burden on those people yeah. to to figure it out <laughs> you know to yeah. show up in ways that yeah. are uh, that involve risk that could also involve um them being perceived in a certain way or looked over or whatever and so i think there's a lot of nuance to this that sometimes that well-intentioned statement doesn't recognize yeah it's almost like and i said just before it sometimes feels to me like it's oversimplified like most of these things are right it sounds good um the idea of it is positive and everyone definitely can buy into it um and the idea being that if you are able to bring your yourself to work you'll be more engaged you'll be in an environment that's more accepting um you'll be you'd waste less time so you'll be more efficient because you're able to kind of not have to navigate some of the things um if, especially if you're having to code switch um so the idea is all of the ideas behind it are positive obviously but it's that whole thing of for that to really work it, the environment needs to be inclusive yes and it needs to facilitate what may not be the status quo when it comes to people's real selves right there's going to be there will be a bias of what the collective think are the ways to act to speak to do things and some of these things are not just about what the leaders think they may or may not accept mm -hmm. it's also about what the people of how the people of an organization behave you know, sometimes I've sp I've had various conversations where we've spoken about the fact that that diversity is an outcome, right? So, like, yeah. actually, if you're doing all of these inputs, if you've got a solid hiring process that's fair and equitable, and you're debiasing mm. as much as possible all of these systems in your organization, diversity should be the output. It it's not an input. Yeah, you shouldn't just throw as many black people in your organization as yeah. you can if you're doing all of the right things you should be attracting and retaining those people yeah. and i think for this topic I, I almost think about it in a in a similar way we shouldn't be putting pressure on our people to be more authentic yeah. in that space we should be creating a culture that makes that happen as an output yeah and that people just feel like they're able to do that. Yeah. And and so it's not a forced thing, right? Um, because I also think that, yeah, with this, this more than a lot of other things, my boss might be fine with me having my natural hair at work. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that I'm not going to encounter a microaggression from someone else. Yeah. And so it's the entire organism of the environment as a whole that determines how much of my authentic self I bring. Yeah. And <clears throat> the intention to the intention isn't where you stop, right? And it shouldn't be the measure of of um you <laughs> the measure of success. So like the intention is that everybody feels comfortable at work. So Ella, wear your hair however you want and however you feel most comfortable. Because the intention is good. They don't, you know, the person sometimes saying that doesn't have to encounter the microaggressions and doesn't have to, it's not been thought through deep enough. It's oversimplified, right? Yes. I think you're completely right about the the, the diverse environment and an environment that would be open to that should be the result. That should be the outcome. Yeah. That should be the, 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 the measure of success, not we're just doing stuff that will, because it's the, the intention is the right, it's the right thing to do. And that's just the right thing to do without really understanding deeply um, what environment that might create if it's not thought through properly. Yes. And I think that the, there's important nuance here. So the friend I was talking to just before this, 
you know, I was talking to her about what we were going to talk about today and she gave an example um, from her, her her leadership career when a queer person in her office had gone to Mardi Gras yeah. and came into the office having forgotten to take his nail varnish off Okay, and had a whole, was concerned about it, was worried about it, wasn't intentionally showing up with yeah. the nail varnish because he wanted to had just had just hadn't had time and kind of got himself into a worried state about what that meant and how okay it would be and so i think that that's a great obviously she didn't care um but that's not exactly the point mm -hmm. the point is the the knots that we tie ourselves in to consider how safe is this thing for yeah. me to do? Yeah. How far can I push? It's not even push, but how far can I show up in a way that is genuinely authentic? And that there are loads and loads of aspects to that. You know, I gave hair as one personal example. You know, I was I was chemically straightening my hair from the age of 14 wow. until 2020. <laughs> so a long time to the extent that I only recently feel like I've started getting to know what my hair is like. Yeah. Sounds odd. There's like this experience that you have as a as a girl and as a woman. It's almost like when you start plucking your eyebrows, it's like I what what are my natural eyebrows like anymore? I don't even know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> what that you know, the shape of them anymore. Um I've only recently almost feel like I've begun the journey of getting to know my hair. Yeah. Because from being like a preteen, I was I was manipulating it into a form yeah. that felt acceptable to broader society. Yeah. And I implicitly understood what it said about me before I entered the world of work even what it said about my desirability, what it said about um, how attractive I was seen, how how feminine I was seen as, how, you know, I, I understood implicitly all of those things before I even, you know, 10 years before I, I f more formally entered the world of, of work. And it seemed like a given to me. No one said to me, straighten your hair because it's professional. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nobody yeah. had that conversation. Yeah. That was just baked into my psyche. Yeah, yeah, very much programmed, right? Yes. And there's a and and that is so there's there's like conscious code switching and there's just like programmed code switching. I think where you've like you're you've done it as a as a survival mechanism seems extreme, but it kind of is, right? Like it's a, a, co a coping or surviving mechanism um, that is almost unconscious. It's like, oh, that's just why would you not do that? Like I'm. I, did anybody ask you when you were younger, like why, like why do you straighten your hair? Like, there's any, or was it just like nobody a given? asked me why? Mm. It sounds well. My experience is, I existed in mostly white spaces. Yeah. So nobody questioned my hair. Mm. It felt to me as though everybody had straight hair, and I had to coax my hair into being some version of what my friends had. I think it's it, that having spoken to to black friends who have grown up more in black spaces, yeah. I think those conversations are different, and some of the I envy some of that mm. community um, that that people are able to build as they're growing up in spaces that feel very safe and that everybody has hair like you. <laughs> um, but that wasn't my experience, so nobody asked me kind of why because I think. It sounds daft, but I think my white friends thought that was my hair. Probably. You know, they don't think they considered that it wasn't yeah. <laughs> my natural hair. And there was also this kind of weird, almost shame about the fact that I had hair extensions and weaves and versions of that that felt fake. Mm. You know, so so this kind of thing of like people touching your hair and, and being like, oh, well, you know, you'll be able to feel that that's a hair extension. And mm. that felt kind of humiliating in some way. Yeah. Um, because it wasn't my natural state and I envied the girls at school who could come with a messy bun and that was just their natural hair. But yeah, I think 
none of this is explicit. No. It's very much baked into our expectations. Um, and I think that's shifting slightly. Yeah. But but certainly in the early 2000s, in the early 2010s, it just to me felt like a given. Yeah. I think I think when you look at pop culture then as well, nobody was rocking from... Nobody was rocking an afro. This as, was pre-Lemonade Beyonce. Yeah, pre-Lemonade. Pre Beyonce. Lemonade. <laughs> and like, this was Beyonce rocking an afro in Austin Powers only. Mm, yeah. um, like, but era, playing a right? caricature. Playing a caricature, right? Um, and, um, sh- and very much a, a an accepted style of the time of when that was what it was portraying. But at the same time, it was it was a, a character, right? It was a... You didn't. I ne- I rarely walked around school, and there were. And I went to school in London. Went to a state school in London. Very diverse school, um, but very rarely, even then, did you see people walking around with an afro. It was just like everyone's hair was hair was slicked back, slicked down to the point where I think probably a lot of girls, in particular, um, at that age, have probably had stress related alopecia because it's so mm. slicked back. Yeah, like um, Naomi Campbell. Yeah. Naomi that, Campbell's receding hairline. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like that's a thing um, that a lot of people have. One of my really good friends never really subscribed. And I guess she had a really, a really, um, uh, a really healthy home environment because I never remember her. I don't think she's ever chemically straightened her hair. And she'd only. My sister hasn't. Yeah. And she only, and never felt pressured to do it, even though it wasn't the norm. Um, wore protective hairstyles, mm-hmm. um, and her hair is in such good condition now because yeah. of that. Like people are like, how's it? How does your hair like grow so long? It's like because she's never actually put anything in it. But it's and interesting like, you yeah. saying. So many things have come up as you say that. Partly, how did your hair grow so long? Mm. I used to think my hair didn't grow. Because it broke off constantly. Yeah, it was I was just like, my hair just doesn't grow. As yeah. if that was some some yeah. natural state that my hair just only grew to, grew to a certain length. Yeah. So part of this getting to know hair is me realising, oh no, my hair does grow. <laughs> yeah. When it's not um, being chemically straightened to, to, to the point at which it's breaking off. Yeah. Um, but I think that also to your point about home environment, some of these things have to be, I think, almost extra explicit to counteract the messages that society just gives you. Mm. So my experience, I had plenty of experiences as a child in hair salons yeah, where my hair was complained about Mm. in some form. It was difficult, it was too thick, it was too unruly, it was a pain. It felt like a burden. Yeah. And so straightening it felt natural to me. I'm only now realizing, I'm a mixed race person who doesn't really have a super, super coarse hair pattern. Mm. It's not. (laughs) But I was having my hair done by people who, sometimes were white people, Mm. who said they did black hair, but... Yeah. Don't make that mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Get that white person away from your head. <laughs> but like, it's not really white people. It's white salons. It's like white yeah. salons that say they do Afro hair. Yeah, It's not true pretty much ever. Um, Same with barbers. Yeah. So it's all of those experiences that my parents told me my hair was beautiful. But those experiences were so embedded into yeah. my psyche that yeah. I didn't believe them. Yeah. yeah. So I think there's a, so much work we have to do in our home environments to especially nurture to the extent that we counteract some of these messages that are just so, so built yeah. in. It's so true. I remember a couple of years ago having a similar conversation. So my niece is, uh, is mixed race. My sister's similar complexion to me. I don't know how to describe that, but... It and her, her, my niece's dad is Irish, so white, white Irish. Um, and my niece is, I think, if you know, you can see that she's mixed race, and her hair, you can see that she, that you can see that, um, that she's mixed race from her hair, but also could may not be. 
Um, one of I remember really kind of realizing and, and heard some of it from my mum. So my mum's mixed race, but I can see some of the things playing out as well in my niece's kind of as she's as she's like growing and turning into to um, heading towards the teenage years very quickly. Um, of and it's, I think it's playing out slightly differently because she has access to the internet and has access to mm. you know people that look like her and that have similar hair hairstyle ha- have similar hair types to her. Um, but there was a phase where she was um, straightening her hair, like now and then, mm. um, and she probably has similar a similar a similar hair type to you. Mm-hmm. Um, so. We, if it, even with a with a hot iron, I'm sure when it's straightened, it just goes completely straight, right? Yes. Yeah, it just goes completely straight, and it would look like it grows that way. Yeah. Um, put some water in it, and it will go back to its natural, um, natural curl. Um, but I know they're doing it more and more. Um, and what you're saying about like go really going out of your way, I would always comment that it looks really beautiful. I was like, when are you going to get your your curly hair back and make mm-hmm. that an exciting thing as well? Yeah. Because I'm sure people are commenting on. The fact that her hair is straighter is very long, yeah. But at the same time, I want her to know that it's also very beautiful to have your hair just as beautiful, if not more beautiful, because it's your natural hair. To have it in a style that you don't have to go through an hour of like straightening it with the, with the hot iron. And I have noticed that she's much more comfortable. Maybe it's because she's a bit younger, but comfortable going in and out of that. Sometimes it will be st- st- like straight for a couple of months, mm. and then she has it out for a couple of months, and then I think she had, did she had she had corn? No, she had like braids in for a while, and she's just she's playing around with that, and I think that's probably because she has a a um, she is, she's in a more diverse environment, but also I think that like I think the times are slightly changing in going in the right direction, and these and I hope it's not just a trend. Mm. Um, but things like you know, natural hair care is much more. Um, it feels like it's much more accessible. Not that I have to do that because I've got like a short haircut. Um, but it feels like for women, it's much more accessible and accepted. But is that the same in the workplace? I don't know. Well, I think it's the workplace is gradually becoming mm. more like that. When we say the workplace, we're making a fairly generalized statement here and we both worked in tech and and environments like that for a long time so so I think there's a that's perhaps different than working in some other environments but I do think that's gradually changing over time but there's there's safety in numbers right (laughs) it's like the more you see (laughs) black women at work with braided hair the more you're like okay this feels like a thing. Yeah. You know, you're kind of sometimes feeling your way. So there's this microcosm of the workplace where it feels like it's gradually changing. And then there's the, the wider cultural touch points. Yeah. The Beyonce's, the the Little Sims, the the artists who you're seeing with locks and with yeah. um, experimenting with fashion that, that appreciates and, and honours their culture in ways that, felt feel different now than they did in the 2000s where it felt very much like assimilate or die you know it didn't feel like you were a able to do that and b if you did that you certainly weren't seen as attractive Mm. or beautiful yeah you know my when i was 14 and starting to experiment with this stuff my mum had short relaxed hair and she had all my life yeah my mum now has locks yeah so so that feels like it's changing yeah for sure, and it and it opens up an opportunity to have those conversations as a as a young like girl of color to go, mum, like what, like why do you wear your hair like that? And there's where all the stories can start as well of like, oh, these are called dreadlocks. These are commonly worn by you know, and it can, it just opens up and is a is a it feels like to me is like a really good gateway to learning about um, not only your hair, where it comes from, why it's the advantages of having your hair in that kind of style and just putting positive experiences to balance some of maybe some of the the negative experiences that you would come up against. Um, in the workplace, um, for me as a gay black man, I think the, 
there's another element I feel of bringing yourself to work, right? It's by bringing yourself to work, what I've had these experiences where people will respond to you as that person and that thing that they have in their head in a way that really reinforces like stereotypes mm. um, or it's just like really it kind of exposes some stuff and you're like oh like I should I have brought myself to work <laughs> you're like mm. you're like uh, should I get back in the closet go, yeah yeah <laughs> or like should I should I have told you where I went on holiday because the comment back has now been like something that I'm like I now have to think about this for the next three months because I might not know how well, to. Well, this is a question, you know, on the on the gay side of things. How quickly do you? Oh, good question. I think I know what you're going to ask. Bring that up. How quickly do you out yourself? Yeah, I don't necessarily. Um, sometimes even think to speak about it, and I think that's maybe a. a possibly a privilege that I have because I don't think I come across like stereotypically um, flamboyant or camp, which is how most people will process, will be their measure of uh, their framework of deciding if someone is is gay or straight. So I think I, I definitely understand there's a, there's a there's a privilege to be able to go, actually, I know people won't really know unless you can pass. The, yeah, so I can the pass. straight passing. Yeah, as far as people understand the markers of gayness. Yeah, exactly. I can put. I can. I can straight pass, and that's not even like I'm trying to do that. It's just the way that I, I act isn't, um, and the way that I am naturally just doesn't necessarily. It aligns more with I think sometimes what you would expect of a, the the what part you'd pass as being straight. So I think there's a there's a there's definitely a thing that I. I do lean into and it'll be like until I'm comfortable and it comes up naturally, there's no need for me to be like, mm. I'm, I'm gay. If I encounter something that, um, so if someone's homophobic, I will shut that down. Even at that point, do I need to say that I'm gay? Maybe I would, would to be like, so shut, like be careful when you're speaking about those kind of things because you never know. <laughs> interesting yeah. I almost think that I am less likely to bring it if I witness someone being homophobic or they're being homophobic in my presence I think that I don't tell them yeah because I think and this is incorrect but there's a, there's something where I think it undermines my argument that I am doing it from the place that it's personal Ooh, tell me more so there's something so I'll give you an example yeah. we are I'm segueing here. <laughs> I, um, I had an experience once at the hair salon where any, any black woman listening to this will know that going to the hair salon, especially in the, in the years when you're straightening or weaving or anything mm. like that, it's a whole day. You're blocking out the day. You're going on Saturday morning. Eat before you get there because <laughs> it's going to be a long day. Um, so I was in this chair and I'd maybe been in the chair for an hour and I had another, you know, <laughs> most of my marathon to go. And the woman doing my hair started subtly saying some homophobic things, you know, started saying some, I'm fine with it. I've got gay friends. And, you know, you start to go, hmm, Amber, but, Amber flag, yeah, but. <laughs> where are we going? Uh, but I don't want it around my kid. And I was like, hmm. Now we're in. <laughs> now we're in. I'm turning inside out, by the way, if you wanted a mental, like... So I, I because I'm unable to not, started saying, what, what exactly is it you don't want around your kid? And so anyway, we got into this, we obviously got into a conversation about it, and it obviously became very challenging. And I then had to sit in the chair for another three oh. hours. But in that moment... I deliberately chose not to say, well, I'm queer. Yeah. Because it somehow felt like that makes it a problem because I'm queer. Because you've happened to say the wrong thing to the wrong person rather than you've said the wrong thing full stop. Yeah. I I think in that situation, I it wouldn't be for the same reason, but I totally understand why you would do that and why it would feel, why it could feel that way. 
for me, if I was in an environment where I didn't feel safe, I would do the same thing. So yes. I wouldn't. Yeah, that may have been part of it subconsciously. Yeah. I wouldn't. Of, uh, uh, you've got your hands in my head. Yeah. You're saying some pretty nasty things. Yeah. Violent things, really. Yeah. Because I think words can be violent. And I, you're in a position of power in some ways. Yeah. I, I can't leave. Well, I could leave, but I could leave with half my hair done or whatever. Yeah. So maybe there's a subconscious part of that that was self-protection. Yeah. And I, and I, yeah, because I, I think in the workplace, I couldn't. Well, actually, I, no, no, well, it's not the same. But I think in the workplace, I would feel really, I couldn't walk away from that situation. And I may not say that I'm gay, but I'm definitely going to deal with it. <laughs> oh, yes. In a, in a, like, if, if it was that extreme, I would feel like I need to either respond in the moment. And I think maybe that comes with some seniority of going, I, when that's not, we're not going to talk about that. We're not going to think about that that way, right? Like full stop. Like we're not going to start going down that route. Have your own opinion. Don't bring that to work because that is inflammatory, like homophobic opinions. And that's not the type of culture that I would want to be involved in or be a part of. And if there, if I was in a, in a, in culture that encouraged that kind of behavior, I will not be around for long. Mm. Um, and, so I think it, I think it, I think it just is so complicated as well. Like the more you talk about it, different scenarios. Sometimes you're faced with having to make a decision then and there, mm -hmm. and you may not have the energy. <laughs> like that's yeah. the other thing as well. Well, I think this kind of begs the question of: Is there a distinction? Because I think these things are off, these words are used interchangeably. Yeah. Is there a distinction between bringing your whole self to yeah. work? Yeah. Warts and all, you know, whole self. Do you bring your weekend self, <laughs> or uh, and do you bring your authentic self? And what does authentic mean? So for me, you know, the the distinction between those two things is, I'm never bringing my whole self to work. People, just I'm just not doing it. I don't think actually the workplace deserves my whole self, mm. and it has a right to my whole self. And I think we show up in different environments naturally with different selves. Yeah. That's not inauthentic. That's just, that's that's the kind of part of, of human nature. Who I am on Saturday night with my friends is different than who I am when I go home for Christmas is different yeah. than who I am in the workplace. Um, I think that there's a way to bring, or or I have found some way to bring a version of my authentic self to work which isn't raw, isn't unfiltered, is still is still polished in some way. Yeah. Um but it's but it's it's the version of myself, it's the it's the level of authenticity that I feel comfortable bringing. Um and it's it's casual and it's um you know, I bring in aspects of my life, but I don't but I but it's still um curated yeah. almost. And how far do you curate and how far yeah. do you still feel you need to it curate? Just, it reminds me of, um, oh, maybe we'll insert it into um, this discussion. So um, I saw a TikTok the other day of, of this and I shared it with you and it was this guy saying, um, I think the question was, what's the corporate advice that someone's given you um, that you should ignore or something like that, something along those lines. And it was like, just don't bring yourself to work. Like, don't. It's a trap. Um, and 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 it was quite funny. It was done in like a funny, funny way. Um, but <laughs> I then went down, and I will answer your question. But it just reminded me of that. But I then went down the comments, and this is what I love about TikTok. The comments are really commenting all the time. <laughs> like they're doing their job. They are always giving me the most amount of laughs ever so i'm i'm gonna just read a few of them um so this is like this is people basically just giving advice based on that on like doubling down on the the point of that that tiktok 
Um, so one person put, talking about your pets is the safest way to appear personable, but doesn't give away too much. Mm. <laughs> nice. Then someone's written as a reply, yep, I have stock pictures of dogs on my desk. <laughs> just like <laughs> just <laughs> making stuff up. Golden Labrador, yeah. please. Yeah. It's like, oh, everyone's got the same dog then. Um, another one said, um, my manager was irritated when he asked me to tell him something interesting and told him about the weather. Nope, won't catch me slipping. <laughs> <laughs> um, someone just put, and don't trust HR, which is like interesting. I want to know more about the reason why why that person feels like. And I think there is there is some there is some some. I think the way that HR is sometimes branded, HR is, gets a bad rep. Yeah, it gets a bad rep, and I think also. Um, HR should be trustworthy. Yeah. If your HR is functioning as it should be functioning, mm. it shouldn't be a zone in which you... But I think actually lots of people's lived experience of HR is something yeah. different. So th- I have this thing with HR, right? And I, I, and, and, and I, I love HR. <laughs> like, in terms of, like, I think there's so much, as a, as a leader um, and, and a lot of the time, like, managing people within the organisation, I always lean on HR heavily. I think sometimes where there's a confusion, which is something I've definitely had to learn over my years, um, over my over my years, over over my experiences. At the same time, there is also a level of um, at the moment we have this thing where we have like people teams. Some of pe- pe- some of the people, some of the roles within the people team are definitely have the em- the employee um, at heart, and there's that there's the job for HR is a lot of the time to protect the company as well. And I think it's a really hard position for a lot of people teams and HR teams to have to balance. I know that's the nature of the beast, but I think sometimes people don't appreciate that. And I think yeah. sometimes um, it can get really tricky because um, there's like the, when I think when, when people teams go off that jump off point where they're like, Oh, this is now getting to a point where it's, they have to make decisions on things that are, I think, really, really tricky. And when we say bringing your authentic self to work, I also think it's important to have um, not only understand how to interact and work with HR, but also have an external that doesn't have any other kind of, um, what's the word? I love HR, but I wouldn't want to work in HR. Is kind of what I'm saying. Because I think yeah. it's a, I, <laughs> neither I, would I. Yeah, yeah. Because I, think, because I think it's a really difficult. It's a difficult. It's a really difficult job. job, and I think it's it goes so underappreciated. Um, and also, I think there's that um, the the brand is the brand of a lot of HR teams within a lot of businesses, which I haven't been so much in kind of recent roles I've been in. Is that they are purely there for the employee? Yes, I. I, I I have a similar view to you on this in that what I've seen happen, this feels like it certainly happened in tech, is that HR teams have gone through a rebranding and they've started to be called people teams. Mm. And because HR has a bad rep (laughs) Mm. and people have this underlying knowledge that most or or a lot of the way that HR teams have have traditionally functioned is to protect the company, like legal, really. Mm. Um, And so it's been rebranded as people, but it's still got this kind of undercurrent of, are you really for the people? Or are you, you know, so there's this kind of confusion around it. My view on this is that they're two separate teams, which is a whole, which is a whole topic for another day. But But my view is that they're two separate teams. And you've articulated that, I think, better than what what I have. I think that's kind of what I'm saying is like, it would, I very much agree that they, they are two, they should. It feels like they would function well as two kind of more separate teams. That there's that natural friction, mm-hmm. but a lot of the time there's it's, it's not that way, right? <laughs> but maybe that's a conversation for another podcast. Yeah, I, I think th- it is. I think it might be, and maybe we should get some HR professionals yeah. <laughs> yeah. on that episode. Yeah. And we know quite a few. So <laughs> yeah, we do. Whether they want to speak to us after that part of this podcast, who knows? No, love uh, to the HR reps. The HR. It's a hard they job. Know, People partners, it's tough. Yeah, and you know if you've worked with us that we are um, close and you are very much appreciated. <laughs> um, going back to the comments... Um, so another example was boss we want to know your concerns shares concerns boss 
we think you have a negative attitude. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so, so in answer to your question, um, uh, which was, remind me what the question was, um, how... Whole self versus authentic self. self. Okay, so for me, it's about, I think probably very similar, it's about getting that balance. I am not going to take Kieran with my close group of friends that I've known for over 20 years um, who have a lot of context in um, and, and shared experiences and just act exactly the same way mm -hmm. because they know me in a much deeper way than um, someone I've been working with for six months would or someone I haven't even been working with for six months would. At the same time, I think that I have become a lot more comfortable with sharing the more casual Kieran um, and actually think it's gone in my favour. But it's not, it's a work version of Kieran. Still curated. It's still Kieran. curated because I still <laughs> need to do my job and I still need to, um, there's more than just bringing yourself to work. Like, you know, it's that whole thing of like, if I brought myself to work, which was just me, I would just want to be friends with everybody. And like, not just want to be friends with everybody, but it would be more casual. But I'm responsible for like... Difficult decisions. Difficult and... decisions. I'm responsible for ensuring that the teams are performing. I'm responsible for making sure they're happy. I'm responsible for taking things really seriously that should be taken seriously. I'm responsible um, to be trusted by the team. There's a lot of responsibility when you're leading a team. And actually, I don't think someone would want to... I'm not sure how many people would want their friend in like a director role, mm -hmm. treating them as a friend. Um, I think they want them, someone that treats them with respect, that has um, compassion, that is able to show a level of vulnerability when needed and knows when to. And that's something I've had to learn along the way. And building trust with people isn't just about being your authentic self. Like, what does that even mean? Like your authentic self, it's about... Some of it's about consistency. Some of it's about the you people understanding what your core values are. My my core values at work are the same outside of work. So that's the one thing that's mm -hmm. definitely the same. Like I don't compromise my values to be this different person. And I'm not a different person. It's just a different version, a different side. I also wouldn't take my work self to my friends. Yeah, that's, think, that makes sense. Because they'd be like, who do you think you are? <laughs> like they would bring me straight back down to ground. Um very quickly and I'd do the same. <laughs> and I think there's 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 an aspect of what you're talking about here which is just applicable to everyone. Yeah. You know, it makes sense to have a more of a professional self. Yeah. It makes sense to have to work out what that means to you regardless of who you are. Mm. How much of what we're talking about here applies extra if yeah. you are black if you're gay if you are if you're disabled if you are neurodive like how much do those aspects of your identity that bring barriers as far as as far as, far as society and the workplace go yeah. how much of those things can you bring to work yeah. and 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 obviously those things all operate differently you know both of us are queer people both of us are black people my queerness I think like yours doesn't show up in a quote unquote stereotypical yeah. way. Yeah. Most people from my entire career have assumed that I'm straight. I'm femme. I show up in a way that people associate with, you know, people often view queerness as kind of a monolith, like many other things. Yeah. And so they make those shorthand assumptions. So, so I'm straight passing for a lot mm. of people ethnicity on the other hand is not something that you can hide yeah true but then there is something as we've spoken about with the hair conversation around it that you can flatten <laughs> in, a, yeah. in a literal and metaphorical uh way and so you still have this ability to to dial up or dial down and be more palatable and be more palatable yeah. what does my eyes by the way what, <laughs> what does professional mean <laughs> what does palatable mean mm. um how much do you bring and and what are the stakes for us yeah and i think that's a really good so that's a really good point there are things that you can 
do to assimilate and become and be more palatable and that kind of stuff. And some of that happens consciously and unconsciously. There are some things that get you by surprise. There's so I once had come back from um from a holiday in Jamaica, um, and I was at this team building event, and one of the we were doing this icebreaker where we had to like say where we'd been or where your last holiday was that was that was hot what was it your last holiday that was hot and then no, so you had to say where the last place that you'd been to abroad um i can't remember the exact questions anyway i it was like a speed dating format where we were like 30 seconds ask those questions answer them and then do it back and then move on and in this specific scenario um I'd moved to this person who is a white cis man, as far as I'm aware. Um, I think Eastern European, but anyway. Um, and I said that I would just come back from Jamaica and the person's first question was, you're Jamaican. <laughs> and I was like... Because there's no other reason to go to Jamaica. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know when somebody just gets you by surprise? It's like, he was like... No, no, just I, I, um, I'm just really surprised, like, because you know you don't speak, like, you know what I mean, like. <gasps> but it was, I was like, it was like blood drain, blah blah, and I was like, <gasps> you know, what I mean? just sharp like, intake of breath. <laughs> I was like, it gets uh, worse. I was like, um, uh, and then my immediate reaction was, well, I'm, I'm British. Mm. I was born here. My mum was born here. I didn't go into the details because I don't think it's a, it doesn't matter that my mum's mixed. I don't, 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 I'm not going you have into to justify. that. I'm not justifying anything to you. But my immediate reaction was, I'm going to give you a quick lesson now, which is I'm British. And that's, why would you think that just because my heritage and and is uh, that I come from Jamaica that I would, and even, and what you're saying is not Jamaican. Like well, there are so many layers to this. Yeah, it's so many layers. The first instinct that you would have only gone to Jamaica as a as a brown yeah. person yeah. if you're from Jamaica, that's the first assumption. Yeah. You might not be Jamaican. I'm not Greek. I've been to Greece. Yeah. So there's that there's yeah. that initial reaction. Then yeah. there's the you don't seem like a Jamaican. In my assumption of what a Jamaican looks or sounds or, or yeah. whatever. And what like, he described was. Then I'm going to do an impression. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, which was the impression was of someone from London. Yeah, so he's basically <laughs> doing an impression of a of a kind of generic black person yeah. in terms of the London stereotype. Yeah, and and just a, like a what do they call it the M L M L E yeah M L E accent, which is a common accent which people associate with London youths, like a kind like, of patois. It's like it's like a patois, but it's a multicultural London English. It's not. It's got elements of lots of different cultures mixing together but mostly associated with black people basically in london anyway even though there are people that are just from areas of london that speak like that but it's that idea that that is it's just it was associated with that's what jamaican people speak like in london it's like on the assumption that i know as somebody who uh, sounds like this person doesn't know any Jamaican people, yeah. as somebody who doesn't interact with or know Jamaican people, that I, the arrogance that I know what that is like, mm. you know, I, it's not typical to assume if you don't know any people from a country, yeah, what that means or what that looks like, and in most other scenarios, you wouldn't make those assumptions. Yeah, and where did you think I came from? I don't know any Belgian people. Yeah. Someone said, "I went to Belgium." A, I wouldn't assume yeah. that they're from Belgium, and 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 B, I wouldn't then say, "You don't seem like a Belgian person," in my stereotypical assumption, because I don't know <laughs> what yeah. that looks like. Yeah. So there's these there's these assumptions that people make around your blackness. Yeah, what that means, how it manifests, what they are able to say to you, unfiltered as well. Yeah. Um, there's no there's no kind of thought pattern in that moment where he's gone is this an appropriate yeah. thing to say yeah. to this person and i think the thing that that hits you even harder is i would have never have asked that question to him it didn't even come into my mind no i would never have asked that question to him because i even felt weird about saying he was eastern european one i'm possibly making an assumption um but two 
I it just doesn't really matter. Uh, but what does then? But how that then compounds and why it's why it's important to uh, to describe that is I am a British person and my Britishness is being questioned in a workplace environment, just like off the cuff. And not only is it being questioned, it's being questioned by somebody that doesn't that clearly doesn't have the knowledge and understanding or have done has not gone done any research to understand like the place that they're living in every single day and the people they're working with. And I, I'm not saying you have to go and, go and do like a big education lesson, but that's like a basics. Like, why are you not interested in that? And that, that I mean, that, maybe that's just a personal thing. When I go somewhere, if I'm going to live somewhere, you might go on holiday. I want to understand like how the country got to where, where it is and what the environment might be. And I want to have a better understanding, but maybe that comes naturally because you come up against these kind of things. But I think that's... That's your inclination as somebody who has mm. lived and in at the intersection yeah. of of various kind of minoritized experiences. Yeah. So you're more aware. And I think that this this experience that you've had, what I find shocking mm. often when I talk to white friends, even in the early days talking to my partner, yeah. how little people understand the the ordinariness of that exchange the the ordinariness in terms of how frequent and how how kind of normalized that is yeah how often you have to take that kind of blow and and the blow is significant right it's it's that's an example of of what might be termed a microaggression mm. but the blow is not micro no it's a it's a deep identity hit yeah. that you take when somebody questions your mm. Britishness in the moment. Yeah. And so when you take all of those experiences compounded over yeah. time and you brush them off as you have to, because the other thing that happens, um, and I'm specifically talking about your blackness here, mm. is you're not allowed to react. So yeah. you're you're acutely aware, again, yeah. no one's explicitly said this to you, yeah. but you're acutely aware that you're not allowed to react, yeah. even though you're the victim of that yeah. racism. Yeah. In the moment, if your reaction were, what the fuck? Yeah. I'm you the become immediately the aggressor. So it's the blow and it's also the the internalization of I now have to work out how to calmly respond yeah. to this reasonably, mm. logically. And so there's no it measured. <laughs> yeah. So there's no way I can be seen as the aggressor here. It's squeaky clean, right? You have to be like, there could be nothing that would be taken out of context or be perceived as something else. I think the other part of that, which is like, and I have to laugh about it because it was just like, before I'd registered what happened and, and responded to it, it was like, next! And everyone like moves along. I was like... <laughs> Speed dating. And, yeah. <laughs> the next. and then I'm like, I'm explaining, the, I'm then trying to, and I think it's like a really good, like, a really good example even though it's like in that that specific environment, it's like an extreme of like what you have to do, right? It, you you take it on, and then I, I'm like, right, I'm gonna. Pro it go it gets not locked away, but you're like, okay, I'm gonna need to process that. I'm gonna I'm gonna I need to process that. I know I'm gonna have to process that, but not now. And then yeah. I then spent the next couple of like weeks and months, and it wasn't on my mind all the time, but there were conversations that I was having with like my my family about it, about what had happened, how they think I should, how I should approach it. What do they think? Get other people's opinions, tell people how I feel. It's energetically um, draining. Yeah. And then I was like, I'm going to do something about it. And then I think when I decided to do something about it, the person left and I was like, Oh, but I, I did, but I have shared it since with people um, who were, who were in that, in that, that company and they are shocked by it. Like it's a, uh, and I don't think they're just going, Oh my God. Like they're like, Wow. That's, and these things are happening. But I think going back to your question, which I've managed to, I think, avoid twice now. <laughs> so I think the thing that I would say is I've become a lot better at sharing um, a measured amount of myself, which I feel is appropriate. And it's and these small things sometimes make you stop and think. But actually, it wouldn't. I wouldn't have done anything differently in that situation. And I think the more I process those things the more I will not only get better at responding to them and making sure that I can create, help create an environment that 
that is it's, it's all education a lot of this stuff right it's just it's i'm sure it wasn't intentionally racist racist right not like making an excuse but most racism isn't yeah falls under the category <laughs> yeah. of not intentional <laughs> yeah it's so true but i think it's it's not intentional but it's blindly unintentional if someone isn't told that it's racist if you know what i mean like yeah there's an there's an intention versus impact yeah. question and i think sometimes I said most racism isn't intentional. I'm not sure that's actually true. I think subconsciously a lot of yeah. racism is intentional and yeah. people often know exactly what they're doing. Ooh, subconsciously a lot of subconsciously. That's... But I think lack of intentional mm. lack of intentionality can be an excuse. Yeah. I didn't mean to be racist to you. Or I didn't intend it that way. That's just the way you read it. Yeah. So so it's a it can be a strategy to put the onus on you, yeah. you've misinterpreted me, so that's a you problem. Yeah. So I think that can be an excuse. Some some people are just genuinely oblivious. Yeah. <laughs> but a lot of that I didn't intend it can be uh, uh, something to hide behind. Yeah. 